Hi everyone and thanks very much for logging into this short webinar on anatomy and veterinary dentistry. A good knowledge of anatomy is an essential starting point in veterinary dentistry. The crown is covered by enamel. It meets the root at the cemento enamel junction, referred to as the CEJ. Anatomically, the CEJ is the neck of the tooth that is not normally visible. Teeth have one or more roots. The point where the roots diverge is called the fication. Depending on the number of roots a tooth has, this can be a bifurcation or a trifurcation. The apex is at the end of the root, which has a multiple canal foramen to carry blood vessels, nerves and lymphatics into the pulp. The enamel covers the exterior surface of the crown. It's the hardest substance of the body. Cells called amnioblasts form the enamel and it is capable of only very, very limited repair as it has no nerve or blood supply. Dentine supports the structure of the tooth. It's the second hardest tissue in the body after the enamel. As long as the pulp is alive, dentine is laid down in layers within the pulp cavity. Dead pulp will not do this, so damaged teeth will show an increasing difference of pulp chamber width on x-rays as the animal ages. Tertiary dentine forms because of trauma. It's very dense in structure and a darker colour than normal dentine. Dogs that tend to carry tennis balls or abrasive items usually wear down the crown and show tertiary dentine. This top image is from a rock chewer which shows a brownish reparative dentine. In the bottom image we can see a production of tertiary dentine caused by slight attrition on the mesial aspect of the mandibular canine. Pulp is a living tissue that is in the pulp chamber and root canals. It's vascularised, comprises of connective tissue, blood, lymph vessels, nerves, collagen and odontoblasts. Odontoblasts line the pulp cavity and branch into the dentine tubules. Any exposed dentine will be sensitive to temperature and pain due to these nerve endings. As an animal ages, odontoblasts lay down secondary dentine which reduces the width in the pulp cavity. This causes the tooth to become much stronger in older animals. Cementum covers the enamel free parts of the root. It provides a point of attachment for the periodontal ligament. Cementum is a live tissue capable of continued formation, destruction and repair. It gets its nourishment from vessels within the periodontal ligament. Tooth roots are encased in alveolar bone, trabicular bone and compact bone. The cavity that surrounds the root of the tooth is called the cribiformum plate, which is the densest bone. On x-rays, it can be seen as a white line called the lamina dura. X-rays are necessary to assess any trauma that has been caused to the alveolar bone and the dental structures. The periodontal ligament is made up of collagen fibre bundles, which are anchored to the alveolar bone on one side and the cementum of the tooth on the other. The periodontal ligament acts as a shock absorber and holds the tooth in the alveolus. The periodontal ligament contains nerves which transmit cold, heat, pressure and pain. Attached gingiva is visible to the naked eye and attaches tightly to the subgingival connective tissue and bone. It's keratinized to withstand the stress of tearing and ripping food. The mucogingival junction is the junction between the soft, fleshy mucous membrane of the oral cavity and the tough, collagen-rich attached gingiva. The MGJ stays in place through life. The gingiva around it may change in height due to pathological change such as loss of attachment, recession or hyplasia. The free gingiva forms a visible gingival margin visible during examination. It surrounds the crown of the tooth. The gingival sulcus is the area between the tooth and the free gingival margin. It's the crevice that surrounds the tooth. The normal sulcus depth is 0.5 to 1 millimetre in cats and 1 to 3 millimetre in dogs. 
Through loss of attachment and active disease, it's common for the sulcus to deepen. The junctional epithelium becomes inflamed and parts from the root surface. Junctional epithelium is located at the bottom of the sulcus. It's important in the control of periodontal disease. The structure attaches to the gingival tissue and to the tooth enamel. Through inflammatory swelling, the junctional epithelium is pulled away from the tooth, causing the sulcus to deepen. A pocket will then form, causing pathogens to come into contact with deeper structures, primarily bone and periodontal ligament. Here is a list of dental specific terminology which will help you accurately describe pathology in the mouth when performing dental charts. Palatal describes the surface of the tooth towards the palate in the maxillary teeth. Lingual describes the surface of the tooth towards the tongue in mandibular teeth. Labial is the surface of the tooth towards the lip. Buccal is the surface of the tooth towards the cheek. Mesial is referred to towards the central incisor and distal is referred to as away from the central incisor. Apical is towards the root tip and coronal is towards the crown. When we describe rostral, we're talking about towards the tip of the nose and caudal being towards the tail. Occlusal is the surface closest to the corresponding teeth on the opposite dental arch. Interproximal is the surface between adjacent teeth. Supragingival is coronal, so above the gingival margin. And subgingival is apical, below the gingival margin. The consul should start by gaining a detailed history from the owner. Has the owner noticed any abnormalities? Got any concerns? And what is their reason for coming in today? Note any previous dental procedures. When did they last have one? And what work was carried out? Obtain a detailed information on the patient's diet, chews and snacks. Discuss eating patterns and behaviour. Generally, your patients will not show dental pain and will continue to eat. Therefore, an owner may be unaware of disease until more obvious signs are present. Our patients can feel dental pain, as we know, and dental dentine exposure is really painful. Find out what the owner uses for dental home care and if they manage to, to carry out any toothbrushing. When we are taking a history, always maintain empathy with your client and patient. Ulcers, rough surfaces or damaged teeth may not appear painful to the owner, but are highly significant for oral comfort. Try to relate to the clients how they would personally feel with similar, similar pathology. Signalment. Look out for any development problems, formation abnormalities, or eruption problems. Problems may also occur when the dentition changes as the animal ages. Breeds. Certain breeds are more predisposed to dental disease than others. For example, our brachycephalic breeds and small breeds are more likely to, to develop significant oral disease earlier due to overcrowding and the physical shape of the head. Also, we need to think about the species. Although tooth resorption occurs in dogs, tooth resorption may affect between 30 and 60% of our feline patients. We also need to note down any presenting signs, so any weight loss, anorexia, halitosis, dysphagia, abnormal salivation, inability in opening or closing the mouth, chattering jaws or facial swelling. We need to ensure that the client has a positive experience during the consult and we need to work on changing client's belief as well as behaviours. Once we have gained a detailed history, we can then move on to a visual examination. Inspect the head and neck from a distance. Take time to observe the patient undisturbed. 
either while in the carrier or walking around the consult room. Palpate the head for signs of swelling, heat, pain or sensitivity. Palpate the submandibular lymph nodes and in inspect the lips externally. Retract the lips and examine the inner surfaces, paying special attention to the buccal mucosa, rostral surfaces of the incisors, buccal surfaces of the canine, the premolars and molars. While examining the teeth during this brief exam, note the amount of calculus, gingivitis, attrition, enamel defects and enification. Also check the canines and all cats that come into the consult room. Obviously only cats that allow, not any fractured cats. The pulp cavity is less than one millimetre from the tip. So fractured canines are very common and also the pulp is painful if exposed. You may actually see up to one cat per day in practice with fractured canines. Then note any missing teeth. These can be very significant and always require x-ray under GA. Check for any persistent deciduous teeth. There should never be two teeth of the same type in the same place at the same time. X-rays are required. There is often some degree of reabsorption of the deciduous root. Examine the tongue both dorsally and ventrally. Examine the mucous membranes of the gingiva, mouth floor and palatal tissues. Note any abnormalities such as bleeding, unusual swelling, foreign bodies, inflammation, ulceration or changes in colour. Once we have done this, we're then ready um, for a full GA and a detailed periodontal exam.